Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Is it possible to be a Catholic and a feminist? That was a question Celia Vigo Wexler asked herself, prompting her to write a book called Catholic Women Confront Their Church. We'll talk to Celia coming up. We'll also hear from the president of Catholics for Choice and talk to a member of the Catholic Women Religious about her work on environmental justice and social issues. Since we're talking about Catholicism in the 21st century, we reached out to the Archdiocese of Hartford to join, but did not hear back. First, we want to talk about President Biden, a practicing Catholic who met with Pope Francis in Rome recently. Biden has been very public about his faith, but he's also a Catholic who supports abortion rights. For more about their meeting in Rome, joining us now on Zoom is Francis X. Rocca, the Vatican correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Frank, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks. Our listeners can join as well, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Now, I understand that uh, the Pope and the President met for much longer than usual. So tell us what you know about that meeting. Well, it lasted 75 minutes, which is extraordinary. I can't remember any head of state spending that much time in private with him. Uh, President Trump was there for half an hour, which is pretty standard. Uh, Obama got more than 50, 5 minutes. So that was that was a lot. But 75 minutes is uh, really um, record, probably. And what do we know about what they discussed? Or was it mostly private? Well, it was private. There was only a translator there in the room, or I guess two translators, probably. But the um, uh, the Vatican statement and the White House statement both stressed areas of agreement, uh, you know, the environment and uh, uh, poverty. Uh, there was uh, the, the White House, the, sorry, the Vatican statement noted religious freedom, which is uh, ambiguous. It could be just simply that he ur- that the Pope urged and the Pope and the Secretary of State from the Vatican urged President Biden to support religious freedom around the world. Or it could have been a nod towards some of the concerns that the U.S. bishops have in the U.S., but it didn't mention, neither statement mentioned abortion, which is notable because usually when the Pope meets with the U.S. president, he does mention that. And that's in the official statement. Mm. He also, according to President Biden, uh, told the president that he's a good Catholic and should still receive communion. Talk about why this is controversial when you think about how uh, the U.S. bishops uh, consider uh, President Biden's stance on abortion. Right. Well, that's right. He's been very strongly criticized by the leadership of the U.S. bishops. Uh, The president of the U.S. bishops conference said uh, on inauguration day, he said that the president Biden uh, supports policies that would advance moral evils, including abortion. Uh, And in a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, the uh, the bishops are going to meet in Baltimore and they're going to debate whether or not a document that they're approving should say anything about Catholic politicians uh, and abortion, and and whether that disqualifies them from receiving communion. And some bishops have said already that politicians uh, like uh, President Biden and uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi should not receive communion because of their support for abortion rights. Mm. Can you talk more about uh, this uh, in the context that you've been covering the Vatican for a long time? And when you look at uh, Pope Francis uh, since the time uh, that uh, uh, he was uh, became Pope, uh, you know, this I, the, the talk about abortion rights and also this idea of you know banning communion uh, when uh, people speak out uh, for uh, abortion rights. I'm just wondering if you can give us more context on how Catholics around the world are, are also um, responding uh, to this? Well, this issue about banning politicians from receiving communion is is not exclusive to the United States, but it's pretty distinctively American. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, it's not really an issue. Uh, even at the Vatican, in Italy and at the Vatican, politicians whose parties or whose own voting records are in favor of legal abortion receive communion and no one bats an eyelash. And President Biden and uh, House, uh, he was then vice president, but uh, and Speaker Pelosi, uh, she wasn't speaker, she was majority leader, minority leader, I guess. But in any case, they both received uh, communion at the Vatican 2013 at the inaugural mass for uh, Pope Francis. Uh, I think uh, part of the peculiarity of the American situation is uh, uh, related to uh, the peculiarity of uh, politics of abortion in the U.S. in general, which is that it's very polarized. Uh, it's a it, there. You know, the the court has never uh, the Supreme Court has never really uh, upheld any restrictions, unlike in Europe and in other parts of the world where there's been more of a consensus that's been uh, arrived at through politics. 
And so you see that same kind of polarization reflected, I think, in the church. Mm. And so while uh, there is a church leadership in the United States that would say um, uh, politicians who um, you know, support abortion rights should not receive communion, uh, Pope Francis, you know, he, he doesn't want to, to politicize this and, and ban this. Right. He's in recent weeks, he's made it very, very clear. He's reiterated his condemnation of abortion. He's used especially blunt language, actually blunter language than his predecessor, his Benedict and John Paul would have used. He said it's murder. It's like hiring a hitman to solve a problem. I'm really, really harsh. Uh, so he's made it clear that he's not uh, he doesn't think abortion is OK. But he's also said, yeah, don't politicize communion. And he's made it pretty clear, I think, with his gestures toward President Biden and the friendliness with which he received him. And according to the president, uh, he, he even told him so. So this, the Vatican certainly hasn't contradicted that or even off the record, uh, as far as I've heard, said that that isn't true. You're hearing uh, Francis uh, X. Rocca here on Where We Live. He's the Vatican correspondent for the Wall Street Journal as we talk about Catholicism in the 21st century. And so uh, talk about some of the changes uh, in the Vatican uh, since uh, Pope Francis became a pope um, that stand out to you, Francis. Well, I think the message, I mean, he certainly uh, made it clear that he wants to emphasize uh, social, economic justice, environmental issues uh, over what he thought was an overemphasis uh, on uh, the traditional moral issues and especially those uh, very controversial teachings about sexuality, medical ethics. He said very shortly after becoming pope, he said, we can't talk about abortion, contraception, gay marriage all the time. Uh, and uh, so evidently he thought that they were being talked about too much. And again, while he's uh, reiterated his hatred for abortion, of abortion, he has really uh, made it clear that he wants to uh, put more of an emphasis on things like the environment, uh, on, on poverty, uh, inequality. And, and, th and that's really where the energy has gone. And that's frustrated a lot of the conservative Catholics who think that the other side has been given short shrift. And how are the numbers changing, though, when we look at Catholicism in uh, the United States uh, for some of the issues that you just raised, uh, Frank? What do we know? Well, and uh, there was a Pew study, in, I think, in 2019 that showed that uh, more than half of American Catholics, uh, self-identified American Catholics, thought that abortion would be illegal in all or some cases. However, uh, if you look at the Catholics that actually go to mass on a regular basis, uh, it was two thirds who were thought it should be illegal in, in most or all cases. Uh, and so it's a little bit like comparing uh, the general population with the re with registered voters, if you would. Uh, so the, 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 it's still the, the, there's still uh, intolerance of that uh, among Catholics who are actually involved, evidently, according to that. Um, but I think uh, probably more important is that uh, if you look at it from a from a global point of view, which is how the Vatican looks at it, uh, the uh, areas of the world where uh, more liberal attitudes are pre prevailing on some of these issues, also on sexuality, the church is shrinking, especially in Europe, uh, whereas in Africa, for example, the church is expanding very, very quickly, mostly as a result of fertility but also conversions. And the, there they have very conservative attitudes on these questions. So the, the, we look at it from a national perspective, but the Vatican looks at it as a global church, which it is. Uh, we haven't yet discussed uh, another uh, sexual abuse scandal that has rocked uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, I'm thinking of your reporting uh, on the Catholic Church in France. Uh, also, when we look at um, the Vatican's reaction to what happened in Canada, where residential schools, some run by the Catholic Church, separated more than 150,000 indigenous children. Um, some 4,000 children died of disease or by accident. There were unmarked graves that were found. Uh, you know, it just seems that, uh, you know, no matter all the talk about uh, social um, issues and uh, stance on abortion that um, the Vatican, um, you know, has not wavered on, there's these other controversies that, you know, when people think of the Catholic Church, this is what they think of, right, Frank? Well, there's no question that over the last 20 years, especially, these scandals have eroded uh, the moral authority of the hierarchy in the public sphere. There's no question about it. They know it. Uh, everybody knows it. It's a real uh, tragedy from every point of view, uh, what happened. And uh, there is, I think, what you've got is a consensus, at least in the United States, that, um, but also increasingly in Europe, 
uh, that we, uh, th- this is not the time to be defensive. We have to uh, admit what happened. We have to apologize for it. We have to make sure it doesn't happen again and that we punish uh, the people who are guilty. Uh, that's, that's true in some places. Not, I don't know if that's the consensus all over the world. I think there's still a lot of resistance to the idea that the, uh, the, the church is particularly to blame for this. There's a lot of defensiveness. Uh, I think that there's an understanding you don't say that out loud. But I think that the, a lot of the world still lags behind uh, the United States and the English-speaking countries, particularly in, 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 in facing up to this. You've also written about the evolving views in the church surrounding gay marriage. Can you talk about what's happening in, in Germany? Well, Germany is a very, very progressive church, uh, and uh, they have been uh, discussing at a series of meetings uh, some changes, that, some proposed changes to Catholic life that they believe are necessary to respond to the, to, the, to the abuse crisis, actually. The abuse crisis was the sort of, was the trigger for this movement. Uh, but these are also pro- proposals that a lot of people in Germany have been pushing for a while. Uh, and some people uh, think that there should be uh, sacramental marriage ex- extended also to same-sex couples. That's still a minority view. What is much more common, uh, even among a lot of bishops, is that there should be some sort of blessing uh, for same-sex couples. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a demonstration back in May all across Germany and more than 100 churches where they blessed same-sex couples in defiance of a Vatican statement that had come out a couple months before uh, saying that, that you cannot do that because God cannot bless sin. And that was very controversial in Germany. The Pope approved that statement. Uh, which uh, which also seemed to clash, uh, for some people, seemed to clash with his earlier, more tolerant, more conciliatory statements toward gay Catholics. And so, as you know, the, the German church is still moving along in that direction, despite these statements. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they they fra- they passed a resolution uh, last month uh, calling for. Uh, well, it's, it's still it's still a draft resolution. They didn't have the final approval, but it got a high, a lar- large uh, amount of support calling on the Pope to allow these blessings. Uh, that's unlike that's not going to happen, I don't think. But the fact on the ground is that these blessings have been going on now for ten years and are going to increase. And uh, the 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 reality on the ground in Germany and in other parts of Northern Europe some other parts, is that this has become part of uh, life of the church. And so that's uh, scared some people, making them think uh, that this is uh, leading to some sort of schism. That if you have, you know, one part of the church, uh, you know, in Africa that's saying that this is sinful, you're going to go to hell. If you do this and the other part saying, no, this is a blessing, this is really great, uh, that's kind of hard to reconcile. In in an earlier time, these kind of divergences might have been easier to uh, to uh, to tolerate, but in the age of in a global media age, uh, these incongruences are, are are pretty disturbing to some people. You've been hearing Francis Rocca here on Where We Live again, Vatican correspondent at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Are you a practicing Catholic or once were? How have your how have your has your relationship changed with the church when we look at how society has changed in the last few decades? We want to hear from you too. 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Can you be a feminist and a practicing Catholic? My next guest asked herself that question. She wanted to learn how other Catholic women struggled with belonging to an institution that did not support their beliefs in women's equality. Celia Vigo Wexler would go on to write Catholic Women Confront Their Church, Stories of Hurt and Hope. She joins us now on Zoom. Celia, welcome. Thank you. Our listeners can join as well, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Celia, tell me more about what was going through your mind when you started writing this book. Well, it's it's very interesting. I really had reached a fork in the road. And and when I'm conflicted and I'm a journalist, um, the way I, I deal with things is to get more information. So I searched out 
women that I thought would would be feminist and have be Catholic and have compelling stories. And I, I most of the women in my book that I profiled, I've never met before. So I really do think the hand of providence kind of guided me, because in the beginning I didn't know that I would have a book at the end. I just knew that I felt very alone in the way I, uh, my, I in my faith, in this journey. Uh, Catholic women in my parish didn't talk to one another about our feelings, about our faith or what the uh, official institutional church said. So I felt very alone and I, uh, that was what was behind the book, something very personal. It was a quest. And what makes the book uh, surprisingly to me be, uh, work so well and why I can sort of promote it is that the women I found were exceptional and terrifically generous with their time and their stories uh, really opening up. And what I, I realized is that I was not alone, that many women had these conflicts and that there was a way to address them and that uh, Catholic fe feminist was not an oxymoron. Right. And when I was reading your book, you know, you're clear to also say that, um, you know, you want to separate your faith, your personal relationship with God from uh, the institution because you don't, think that they're one in the same. And, and this is how uh, these women and you have, have wrestled with this idea of, you know, still being close to God and, and doing the work, but at the same time, you know, questioning some of what, you know, comes out of the Vatican and, and, and actions that you see them not taking. Yeah, I think it's, it's very important that uh, the church is, uh, is a human institution. Uh, yes, it was uh, divinely inspired but it's led solely by men <laughs> and, and they don't have all the answers and they have made some huge mistakes. I think we heard about a couple of them that you brought up. Certainly sexual abuse in the church has been a terrible problem for the church for a very long time. And the cover up of that abuse has been an even graver problem. We have a, a, an institution that you know, is in financial difficulty, uh, largely because of the incompetence or maybe in some t times the actually, you know, the corruption of, of male prelates. So that's a problem. Uh, and so as women, when we look at this flawed institution, the way we can stay Catholic is to realize that the institution isn't the whole answer, that, that, that our relationship with Christ, our adherence to gospel values is bigger than the institutional church. Now, I think we would all, many of us, and this includes not only women in the United States, but since the book I've met women reformers throughout the world, um, would like to reform the institutional church, would like to make it work better. But in the meantime, we have to sort of keep in mind that we can have a relationship uh, with Christ, with the church, with our faith, we can think, and we understand too, that since at least Vatican II, and really much more earlier in the church, in the history of the church, what's been important is the primacy of the conscience. You know, the idea is, is that the church recognizes that uh, Catholics are guided by the church's teachings, but in the final analysis, what leads you and guides you is your own conscience formed by the church's teachings in part by it, but by your own lived experience. And we have to keep that in mind. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, as we talk about what it means to be Catholic, especially in the 21st century. Billy is calling in from Middletown. Billy, what did you want to share? Hi, um, I very much agree with what your guests just said. Um, I, uh, um, uh, I and a couple of other people um, are on that uh, page. Um, I'm a practicing Catholic. I came back to the Church about 15 years ago um, after uh, leaving it for quite a, long, quite a while, even though I was raised in it. Um, and I um, am disturbed by some of the uh, 
uh, well, I'm not just going to go on the, the priest uh, excesses, things like that. The some of the um, the the what is propounded theologically um, by the church. I believe that um, uh, you know I am a proud and practicing Catholic, and I will not be driven from the church by uh, uh, disagreement with these issues. Um, I will try to change the church from within, um, and and I have a number of friends who agree with me. And one of the things that drove us together was political conservatism that is in the church um, that we very much disagree with, and that political conservatism uh, is also uh, theological conservatism. But little by little, we're uh, disagreeing with things and hopefully creating a new climate of uh, of rejecting some of the uh, ideas of um, uh, that, that that just have been holding the church back. There's so many things the church could be doing. Um, you know, it's a it, there's a lot of people who are Catholics, and if they got together, we could really help society and. Uh, you know, with poverty, with hunger, um, with all kinds of things. And um, I uh, thank um, you for sharing yeah, that with ahead. us. I think that's a good transition to talking about um, uh, Celia. And you know, when we think about uh, the Catholic population, half of them being women, the women religious, concerned about social justice and poverty. How um, the work that they're doing, and, and how that might diverge from when we look at like leadership, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, who often join the religious conservatives uh, to support, um, you know, conservatism, as uh, as Billy mentioned. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, I think that over the years, uh, uh, this conservative wing of Catholicism in the United States has grown very powerful, in part because of. Uh, conservative donors, mostly men, uh, who have influenced the bishops and uh, have really uh, presented an image of Catholic thought and teaching that doesn't really correspond to what the average Catholic in the few, pew thinks. That part of the reason that it's important, you know, this book was one sort of way to do this, um, is for people to realize that Catholics don't all speak with one voice and they certainly are not all politically conservative. Politically, Catholics pretty much split evenly between Democrats and Republicans. When it comes to what the work of, of Catholic sisters, that's, that's really very much aligned with the priorities of Pope Francis. That, that they really are about serving people. It, it, I would say that's also aligned with what the Gospels teach us. The Gospels say nothing about, uh, you know, this abortion. They say nothing about contraception. They say a whole lot about helping the poor and the marginalized. And it's important for uh, the larger uh, population of the country to realize that Conservative Catholic voices might be very loud, especially in the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, but they are not the whole picture, and and that's very important to, to sort of note. You're hearing Celia Vigo Wexler here on Where We Live, a journalist and author of Catholic Women Confront Their Church Stories of Hurt and Hope. I definitely want to hear about some of the women you profiled, Celia, in your book, but I, I wanted to bring into the conversation uh, on the phone with us uh, Jamie Manson, who's president of Catholics for Choice. Jamie, welcome. Thank you, Lucy. What a pleasure to be here. Respond to what Celia just shared about, um, you know, Catholics, especially in our country, and uh, when we think about the institution and some of the stances and, and how that percolates to someone like you and how you've been able to find a way to move forward with your faith uh, despite some of these institutional stances. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm like kind of the perfect specimen in this experiment uh, because I'm a woman who's called to the priesthood, I'm a lesbian, uh, and I'm a pro-choice Catholic. And so how do I find my place in the church? And, um, you know, it was a, a, a long, it's a constant discernment. Uh, but really, uh, my life changed when I was at Yale Divinity School uh, in the great state of Connecticut. Uh, mm -hmm. And I realized that there is something unique about the Catholic tradition. And we have this very rich sacramental understanding of, of the human person, uh, of nature. 
And that is what gives my life meaning. I had the opportunity to leave the church and become ordained in, in a Protestant church, um, but I realized that there was something um, unique and beautiful about the way in which we understand grace and the way in which we understand God. And I decided I wanted to fight for the soul of the church um, because of that, what I see is something profoundly beautiful and true. I mentioned you're president of Catholics for Choice. So tell us about this organization. And for people who uh, may not know this, you know, the idea that there are Catholics out there who are pro-choice. Absolutely. Yeah, we we have been around for almost 50 years, and we amplify the voices of pro-choice Catholics uh, in the United States and globally, actually. And uh, as Frank Rocco was saying, uh, 56% of Catholics in the United States do think abortion should be legal in all or most cases. 68% do not want to see Roe versus Wade struck down. And we are actually at the precipice of po- very possibly seeing Roe versus Wade struck down uh, during this it, it, within this next year. So we try to be that voice, using our conscience, using our understanding of promoting social justice and human dignity and freedom in our conviction. Mm-hmm. So talk more about um, some of the uh, members of your organization and you know what they wrestle with in terms of seeing uh, change or reform to the church. Because I imagine you know if women were to be ordained at some point, that's not a magic bullet to reform the church, mm-hmm. right? It isn't, no, but it is essential, I think. Um, it's so important for people to remember that women have no voice, no decision-making power, no opportunity for authority in their church, and that, that what you have as a result is probably the most radical patriarchy in the world uh, leading the Catholic Church. So it is, it is an uphill battle. I mean, all of the issues I contend with are uh, but they're worth it, uh, because I believe the Catholic teaching that, that God works through all things, and God can work through the body of a woman as well as God could work through the body of any as someone of any other gender. So that is really what we struggle with, and, and I think her voice is more important than ever. We have the first unequivocally pro-choice Catholic president in the White House. We have a pro-choice Catholic Speaker of the House. Nearly 100 members of Congress are, are, are Catholic and pro-choice. So, it, it, you know, it's really important that our, our voices are heard, because the voice of the laity is actually very important in, in discovering theological truth. It's not just about what the celibate men say. Right. Celia, did you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Pope Francis's tone has been good uh, since he came on board. But, you know, my book was published in 2016. And women were uh, not optimistic about what Francis would actually do to empower women in the church. And we have, are unfortunately, nothing really has changed. In rereading my book, I realized that the same problems confront us. And one huge one is that women don't even have a voice. Every couple of years, you know, the church calls bishops to the Vatican to discuss pressing problems that the church needs to address. And women, you know, a couple of dozen women now may participate in those synods, that's what they call them. But at this point, uh, several hundred Catholic men have votes in that synod. But at this point, maybe one woman in the next synod in 2023 will have a vote. That's scandalous. That's just beyond belief. We're half of a church that consists of more than a billion people. Um, we women have so many gifts, and there's such great need. The bishop, the pope has, you know, there's been a whole controversy about the ordination of women deacons. Uh, a deacon is someone who we have Catholic laymen who are married who are deacons who can uh, preside over baptisms and weddings and funerals and uh, preach. Uh, And in the early church, as Phyllis Zagano makes clear in her book, there were women deacons. So it should be a no brainer that we're able, the church is able to, to reinstate that practice of women deacons who could really help with the shortage of priests in the world. Uh, You know, ordination of women priests absolutely should happen, but at least we should have women deacons. The Pope is formed two commissions to look at that, nothing has happened. So yes, I mean, the it, it's appalling that the messes the church has made have been from 
the primacy of men over women in the institution. And it, it's very discouraging. Uh, Celia, in your research, you know, how many women, uh, because of what you've just shared, um, have chosen to no longer be part of the Catholic Church? Well, you know, if you look at some of the statistics about, uh, you know, uh, weekly mass attendance among women, uh, since the 80s, that kind of uh, mass attendance has gone down precipitously. Uh, in the last survey that was done in 2017, if you combine the number of women who say they go to Mass every week and the, the number of women who go to Mass almost every week, that's about 31%. So that means that more than two-thirds of Catholic women, women who identify as Catholic, don't go to Mass. Now, is that the only way you can be a Catholic in the Church? No. But it shows you that women are walking away. Uh, and what's worrisome to me is that of the 10, the nine women I profiled, and well, the 10, including me, uh, five of the six of us who have adult daughters are no longer practicing Catholics. And these are the women the church needs, the women who will push them forward, the, pe the, the women who are reformers, uh, the women who won't say stay silent because we all raised our daughters to be feminists. And uh, they, this generation, the millennial generation and the future generations, will not satisfy, be satisfied with second-class citizenship in the church. And the church will be poorer for that. And that's very sad. Jamie Manson, I wanted to go back to you again, president of Catholics for Choice. And so, um, you know, I wanted you to respond to what Celia mentioned, but also what, you know, you'd like to see uh, moving forward. You mentioned uh, Biden uh, being a Catholic president. Um, there's a movement against, um, you know, women's reproductive rights. And so, you know, what realistically do you think uh, could be achieved in uh, the, the next few years, if at all, in the U.S. Catholic Church? Well, I think uh, Celia is saying something important that actually relates to something Frank Rocco was saying earlier, uh, which is that, well, two-thirds of Catholics who go to church, you know, do not support abortion rights. I want to challenge that, because whenever I hear that, I think of my mother, um, who does not go to Mass anymore, but goes into the church when there is not Mass going on and says the rosary sometimes every day of the week. Why doesn't she go to church? Because she doesn't want to hear homophobia. She has a lesbian daughter. She doesn't want to hear anti-women homilies. Um, you know, it's not life-giving for her. The, the, the traditions and the rituals are still life-giving, but it, it is not a, a safe place, really, for women or the parents of LGBTQ people. And so it's really important to examine those numbers. Uh, so when we say that 56% uh, of Catholics do support abortion rights, we have to think much more broadly about what it means to be Catholic um, and, and, and what it means to participate in the life of the Church. And just going to Mass every Sunday certainly does not qualify for that. And we have to, again, think about why people aren't going to Mass on Sunday. What are they? What is wounding them? What are they not wanting to hear? What are they trying to avoid, but also somehow get spiritual sustenance uh, where they can, uh, like my mother saying the rosary, uh, when mm -hmm. the Church is empty? What I think needs to happen, Lucy, and this I really want people to hear this, is that 24% of abortion patients in the United States identify as Catholic. That's a significant number, and one in four women has an abortion in the United States. So we are talking about the women who are coming in and out of these church doors every day, uh, women who were baptized into this church. And so what the church needs to do, which it refuses to do, is listen to women. Listen to women who have had abortions. Understand the human story behind this decision and the human toll it takes to keep telling people, women and families and, 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 and gender creative people who have chosen abortion, what it means to say this is murder, uh, that then under no circumstances can you, can you choose this. Um, even Pope Francis himself recently called abortion homicide. What are you saying about the people in your own church? Who, when you say things like that, you know, where is the church of encounter where, that Pope Francis wants when he says something like that? Where is the church of engagement and mercy and compassion and listening? And so I think until the, the, until the leadership of the church really starts to do that, um, we're not going to move forward.
Uh, Jamie, before I let you go, uh, you mentioned uh, that you're a lesbian, and earlier you said that that's not a well, the church is not a welcome place uh, for LGBTQ people. And so how do you keep your relationship with Catholicism? Yeah, it, it is not a welcome place. And, and while I am somewhat, honestly, I mean, I came out in 2008 in the National Catholic Reporter. It was a very different church, and it was a very different society for LGBTQ people. Uh, and I have to say, I have been surprised at the movement that has been made for Pope Francis to say he supports civil unions is stunning. But at the same time, he's saying that, oh, but you can't be sacramentally married because the church cannot bless sin. And it's so important for people to understand when church leaders say that, they're saying that my love is not equal, my love is not good, my love is not capable of holiness. And what that does is create shame. And it's a very similar action to what they're doing with, with President Biden, potentially denying him communion, or Nancy Pelosi communion. It's creating shame. It's creating unwelcome. And it is absolutely in total conflict with what Jesus taught us to do. His most essential message was feed one another. This is the central ritual of our church, and it is God's table. It is not some man's table. And so that's what I have to keep remembering, is that remember what, you know, what is the heart of this tradition? What is the heart of these sacraments? And I carry that with me. I don't go to Mass right now because I can't be in a space where women cannot have a voice or exert any kind of authority. Uh, but but my whole worldview is Catholic. The way in which I encounter every human being is profoundly Catholic. And so I carry forward those teachings, and I struggle, you know, every day with this church. And some days I struggle with this church um, because I want to, I, I, you know, I really do want to fight for the soul of the church because I love the church. But there are other days that, that I struggle because the church is so powerful politically, legislatively, in the courts. And they're taking away our civil rights, and uh, they're keeping, you know, people from contraception um, and, 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 and from workers' rights. And so regardless of the day, that is why I struggle. Hmm. Jamie Manson, again, is president of Catholics for Choice. Jamie, thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure, Lucy. Thank you. Celia Vigo Wexler will stay with us. She's author of Catholic Women Confront Their Church. We'll continue talking after the break. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about Catholicism today with my guest, Celia Vigo Wexler, author of Catholic Women Confront Their Church. And joining us now on Zoom is Sister Emily Tokolsky, Grassroots Mobilization Coordinator at Network. And also she's with Sisters of Providence of St. Mary of the Woods in Indiana. Sister Emily, welcome to the show. Thanks. So good to be here. So what drew you to this community of Catholic women religious? Well, Quite simply, it was encounter. Um, I was living at a Catholic worker community in Indianapolis, and uh, I had moved in maybe a month ago, and I uh, heard a conversation between the two founders of the community that there was this this person who wanted to move in with her biological sister for about a year as she was preparing to enter the Sister of Providence. And quite frankly, my my reaction was, oh, great, a nun. Um, So... Uh, we're, we're really close friends now, but she'll tell me that first time I interacted with her, I was not super welcoming. Um, and that that may have been due to kind of my preconceived notions. Uh, I don't know what was going on in my mind at the time. Um, but I, as I got to know her, I realized how much we had in common. Um, and I started to, through her, meet other members of the community. And I just saw this sense of welcome and of life and of passion uh, in these people that I was encountering. Um, and, and in particular, what drew me was the, the work of justice that so many of the sisters engaged in. Uh, we talk about our charism as uh, be, being in service among God's people through works of love, mercy, and justice. Um, and and I, was, I was Jesuit trained uh, in, in college, and, and so that justice piece uh, has been central to 
how I experience uh, life ever since. So tell me more about the work uh, with social justice uh, issues uh, and, you know, the, and why, again, you know, this is um, so powerful when uh, women religious uh, are leading this uh, within the church. Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. Um, you know, really, the the modern idea of what we call Catholic social teaching goes back to the 1890s uh, with the workers' rights um, an encyclical by Pope Leo the Thirteenth called Rerum Novarum uh, that talks about the rights of workers and the dignity of work, and that one person should have uh, a, a wage that's livable for an entire family. And um, it goes back further than that. It goes back. We can trace it back to, for example, Saint Basil the Great in the, the fourth century said, "When someone steals another's clothes, we call them a thief. Should we not give the same name to one who could clothe the naked and does not?" Um, it goes back to Jesus, who, uh, who's as Jamie was saying, whose primary vision was for us to feed each other, uh, and the multiplying of the loaves and the fishes, um, and to the prophets before that. Uh, the Hebrew prophets in the, the Christian Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Hmm. And so uh, for people uh, who are not familiar with Sisters of Providence, so tell me more about some of the, the grassroots uh, efforts that you're involved in. Sure. So this is kind of a combination of my my, my paid ministry position with, with Network and uh, my identity as a Sister of Providence. Um, but really, the the Network piece is... We, we lobby on federal legislation. We try and shape federal legislation to create that society that we want to see. And a network was founded about 50 years ago by Catholic sisters, uh, kind of in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, um, where, where the church said, we're going to open ourselves up to the world. And we started redefining things, not redefining, but going back to the roots of uh, really of of the foundings of our congregations for women religious, uh, to, back to the roots of the gospel, and said we're going to be a church in the world. That the church is not the institution; the church is the people of God. Um, I have a, a great T-shirt from the Catholic Committee of Appalachia that says, "Be the church you want to see in the world," and that's really what I think it's about. Um, and that's what the work of grassroots mobilization. Uh, that's what Billy was talking about earlier. Uh, so, Billy, keep up the good work. You're really uh, doing the work of of creating the society, creating the kingdom of God in this world, the kingdom of love and and justice and peace. Celia um, still Celia is still with us, and and Celia, you wrote in your book uh, of the women you profiled uh, who strongly espouse the notion the gospel compels us to serve others, make the world more just, and reduce oppression. This sounds like the work of Sister Emily and others, women religious in her community. Yes, very much. I mean. Uh... I profiled Sister Simone Campbell, who then was executive director of Network. And I think what's amazing about Sister Simone is that she's a poet. She is uh, so spiritual, and yet um, she is an amazing and savvy lobbyist. And this, uh, her story really uh, points to the difference between Catholic bishops and Catholic nuns in this country. Sister Simone's lobbying helped get past the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act was opposed by the bishops because they were so worried that it might inadvertently pay for abortion services, which it doesn't do. But uh, Sister Simone and, and uh, other nuns uh, really pushed for passage of the act because they understood the larger problem that that people needed health care and they weren't getting it. And, and they really embraced the fundamental biblical values, which is what uh, Emily is doing in her work now. That the, if you look at the gospels, they are all about serving the poor. And if, if we even talk about abortion, you know, poverty is what drives abortion. If the bishops had spent one tenth of the resources that they put into just criminalizing abortion, into actually reducing poverty among women, then maybe we wouldn't, you know, uh, we could have addressed this problem in a much easier way, this issue. Um, abortion is something women are often driven to do because they have no other options. And uh, 
the bishops have failed us immensely, but the nuns have come through for us. I wanted to read a quick social media comment, and Sister Emily, if you could respond. Judy writes, I'm a practicing Catholic for many reasons, like Catholic social teaching. And regarding women, a wise old priest said years ago, if God wanted only men to be priests, there would be plenty of them. Maybe God wants us to find another way. What do you think about that, Sister Emily? Wow, that's that's pretty profound. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I think what's coming to my mind is, as relevant is the story of my own personal transformation on that issue. Um, I, I was raised in a pretty conservative uh, Catholic area, and so I, I held those traditional views for a while. And and it's not something I'm necessarily proud of now, but it was in a conversation um, with. Uh, my my good friend, the one who first introduced me to the Sisters of Providence, um, where I started to to question what I was uh, what I had previously believed, and basically I had said, look, I don't the sacramentality of the priesthood is is very specific, and I'm not I'm not sold on that yet. I can still hold on to those those conservative perspectives on that, but women need a voice at the table. Women need decision making power. And as I said that, I realized that if women had any sort of real voice at the table, that that whole thing would be flipped on its head and we would have women priests. And so that importance of listening to the voices uh, of the whole people of God, and especially those who are shoved to the margins uh, by the structures is so important. Um, and. And I think that importance of, of encounter, of having those conversations over and over again, uh, even when they seem hopeless, that friend once told me that she, her response to that conversation was, wow, I don't think we can be friends. Um, but for me, that was the conversation that transformed me, that opened my heart uh, to seeing things uh, more broadly, to seeing things differently. You've been hearing Sister Emily Tukolsky again here on Where We Live. She's a grassroots mobilization coordinator at Network and also with Sisters of Providence of St. Mary of the Woods in Indiana. Sister Emily, thank you for sharing with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And Celia Vigo Wexler is here, author of Catholic Women Confront Their Church. A really interesting uh, profile of these women, uh, Celia. Thank you. And, and tell us just briefly, you've got another book out or working on one? Well, as I mentioned, I, we, I do have an essay on unruly Catholic women. Uh, I am working on a book about uh, the Italian-American immigrant experience. Uh, I'm sort of struggling. And I do, I am a regular contributor to the NBC op-ed website, Think. Uh, and I often write about Catholic issues there. Uh, other issues as well. But, uh, you know, there's always something to write about uh, in the uh, arena of Catholic politics. Uh, but the book, I think, has had life because I really wanted it to start, not necessarily a revolution, but a conversation. I wanted women to start talking to one another. And I think that's happened. Uh, I know women have written to me and said that they really appreciated the book. I know that sometimes in parishes, uh, women get together in book clubs and discuss the book. So that makes me very happy. Well, Celia, it was a pleasure to hear from you, and I did enjoy reading uh, your book, Catholic Women Confront Their Church. Thanks for your time today. Today's show produced by Tess Terrible. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening. <laughs>